So thank you all so much for being here. I am so fortunate today to introduce my friend, author, storyteller, and uh, world famous garden tour guide. <laughs> uh, and uh, I am just so uh, thrilled to be able to introduce you to my friend Patterson, who has written, written recently an unbelievable, beautiful book that I highly recommend called Autobiography of a Garden. I loved reading this book. This is my time of year to read. And if you want to be inspired, this is definitely, I would say, on your to-do list, especially for those gardeners in your life that you love. It's a wonderful book, but um, I want to thank you so much for joining my audience here today. And sounds like you've got lots of friends who are here with us as well. So it's really nice to to have you here. So Patterson, welcome. Really glad thank that you could join. Thank you. So I am really um, interested on your property. It's so historical, but you have a really interesting story of how you came to acquire this property. Do you want to talk to people about how you came onto this parcel? How did I come to this place? I came to this place by meeting the most wonderful man who was my husband for 55 years, who grew up on this property. Um, and he, uh, before we were even married, I came here. I came to the Eastern Townships of Quebec and I fell in love, not only with the man, but with the area. I still love living here full time. Um, my my father-in-law had owned a part of this property uh, for years and years, and so my husband had grown up here, spending summers here, at swimming in the lake and so on. And when we moved from Ontario to Quebec, it was time for us to start looking to see if we could um, move in again to this place where we had spent summers. We were fortunate enough to be able to buy a piece of property, and then the whole garden adventure began. It was just a, a real treat to, um, to, to have a chance to get to know a part of the country in a very genuine way. Well, it's, it's a beautiful place. Um, I am super inspired now to come to Canada and um, my mom and I love to see gardens. So hopefully we can come see it, but it is a huge property. And I know with just my little tiny forest, one and three quarters acres, it can get overwhelming. So I can't even imagine having a 750 acre property. How did you even say, how do you even know where to begin? Um, that's probably, you know, one of the challenges of anybody inheriting a garden. Like, where do you start? Good question. Where do you start? I think you start with where your heart takes you. And um, for me, the one of the things that really inspired me, one of the things that I really wanted to do when we um, when we moved here and we're spending increasing amounts of time here was to create a garden that um, encouraged people to go outside. You know, sometimes you can just see a garden from inside the house and you look at it and then you see, oh, that looks nice. And then you go back to sitting and reading a book by the fire. I wanted to, I had spent my summers at my grandparents' farm. They had a, a, a non-working farm by the time I was uh, old enough to visit, but it was a farm in the Blue Ridge Mountains in Virginia. And I loved visiting them. There was a big vegetable garden and we would go out and we would take green grapes off the grapevines, which irritated my grandmother no end. But <laughs> we, we spent hours, my, my sister and me and our cousins who were all around, we spent hours and hours exploring the, the the woods, the fields, just wandering around. And that was one of the things that I wanted very much to have happen for my children and my grandchildren that have now been born, to get to know beyond the house. So although I started the garden, as of course most people do, um, by modifying this, that, or the other things around the house, what, um, what I wanted, really wanted, was to get people to go out, to go beyond the, the garden wall or beyond the little fence that enclosed my grandparents' garden. Yeah, so, so that, was, that was a part of it, Heather, originally at least. 
So I love that because I think this is one of the things that they're finding from my childhood and your childhood that's different with this generation is we actually played outside and we were inspired to be outside. And so I love that you actually talk about how you walk through the garden and you get inspired by seeing things, both the wildlife in your garden and, you know, the changing of the seasons. Probably one of my most inspirational parts of your book is I love the dragon tail. Oh, I think that's so cool that you did this very long, very beautiful, but changing seasons. And I talk to my audience sometimes about sort of that symphony of blooms. And mm. I think this is one of the teaching things that I took away from your book is thinking about how the garden's going to look in every season. So are there some things that you could share with the audience about how you think about design and, and constantly having something interesting and new to look at regardless of the time of year? Well, that's a very, first of all, I started off like most people knowing almost nothing about gardening. And I think that it is really, really important to, 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 um, to emphasize that if you can learn, you, you can learn, you learn, how do you learn by making mistakes, by trying things, by, by reading, by taking advice for sure, for sure. But also by just, um, saying, well, I wonder what would happen if, and then trying it. Um, so seasonal interests are less, there's no way that I can have a four season garden. I look out now and what I see is white. I can have <laughs> things that stick up above that white that I add structure, that add interest, but it's not, then it'll be hardscaping. Um, so structure becomes really important, I think, in a garden in the winter time when it's um, when nothing really can be blooming or can be growing. But your question is is bigger than that. Um, you mentioned the dragon's tail. Uh, years and years ago, there was a garden catalog company in in Canada called Crookshanks. And on the front cover of this garden catalog, there was um, a scene, a photograph from um, one of the bulb suppliers in Europe. It was an absolutely gorgeous, long straight line of blue, grape hyacinth, a blue ah, spring bulb. Beautiful. Gorgeous. And on either side, bright green grass. I loved this image. And I thought that it was the contrast of the color, the blue and the green, the strength of that, of that um, straight line. And I thought, oh gosh, you know what? It's just bulbs. I could do that. But I couldn't find any place that felt right to have a straight line. So I did this big curve through the grass and the guy who works with me, Jacques, Jacques said, oh, it looks like a dragon's tail flipping across the grass. So that, that's how that got its name. And the dragon's tail was terrific that first spring. It's a, it's a very long, I forget how many feet, 300 feet or something like that. Wow. Wow. Of, of bulbs. And it's about- I can't to, imagine uh, how many bulbs that is. <laughs> it was a lot of bulbs. <laughs> It was a lot of bulbs um, and it was a, a, a lawn mowers wide. So that was the way we, we shaped it just by cutting a strip of grass with the lawn mower um, and then just making a little couple of changes, modifications. Um, that first year, it was absolutely fabulous in the spring. This exactly what I wanted, but come, come summer, come fall, there was nothing there. So I thought, okay, we have to change that. Uh, what, it, it's a shady spot, which worked well fine for spring bulbs. What could I plant that would be colorful, that would be interesting later in the season? I thought, ooh, a stilby grows well in the shade. Um, so I found an astilbe. But you know, something strange happened. This thing, which to me was so magical, those muscari bulbs, just died out yes. and I don't know why I still mm. don't I don't know why was it the astilbe was it taking too much um nourishment I don't know I didn't cut it down so I any rate there's no astilbe now there's no muscari now 
there are daffodils and I am still looking and they're fabulous in the spring. Uh, I'm still looking though for, for what I can plant later in the season that will fill in that gap. But in terms of a broader question, seasonally, I've got a lot of ornamental grasses. They do extremely well for me and I like them and they uh, add interest. Say something like um, Calamagrostis um, comes up in one kind of color. The inflorescence is pink and beautiful. And then it's tawny uh, autumn color and movement. Mis Miscanthus, all of these grasses I love. And I think that they, ornamental grasses themselves offer a really good opportunity for seasonal uh, change and seasonal differences. I think that's great. And it's great advice. I think we don't use grass enough in gardens and I'm a pollinator gardener and it's probably one of the things we miss the most because it's, it's so, it is interesting. I think even in, I'm looking out my window, I can see one of my grasses, it's very tall and it, you know, it's blowing in the wind right now and it, I've left the seed head so the birds can enjoy it and give them some place to hide. But I think they're interesting regardless of the time of year. I agree. And you know what? And if I look out my garden now through the snow, I can see a couple of things poking up and one of them are the, 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 the heads of the, of the miscanthus, which is still there. It's flattened, but it's yeah. okay. It's, yeah. I'm seeing something more than just white. <laughs> so you mentioned your collaborator. Uh, you talk a lot about collaborators in this book and how you got inspiration. I know when I moved from the South, like you, I grew up in North Carolina, you grew up in Virginia, and then you moved to Canada. I didn't go as far North as you, I'm in <laughs> Pennsylvania, but it's definitely different. Our growing season's about five minutes long. So, yeah. um, so you talk a little bit about the things you were inspired by, like the magazine with the, with the straight line. But you also, I love that you, one, aren't afraid to make mistakes. I think that's a great lesson out of this book is like, you're gonna make mistakes. Um, you have deer that you talk a lot oh, about. Yes. <laughs> I have a groundhog that loves to mow pretty much everything I plant down. But, um, so I appreciate that you talk about what didn't go right, because sometimes as a gardener, when I'm reading books, I feel like, gosh, you're telling me everything I can do, but you're not telling me everything that might go wrong too and what to do about it. So I appreciate that honesty of this book. But I also appreciate that you aren't afraid to take advice. So moving to Canada, I'm sure was a huge learning <laughs> experience as a gardener. Where were your sources of education and inspiration? And can you talk a little bit about Jacques and some of the other collaborators? Okay. Jacques is a wonderful man who has worked on this big piece of land for, well, since he was 16 and he's wow and yeah at 16 years old he started and he's now in his early 70s so he knows this land really really well he's been a farmer um, he's been a, a, a tree pruner um, he's been a gardener he's he does everything um, and he, he's like one of these um, people who just he doesn't have a lot of academic uh, background but what he knows is how to do things. So I'll give you an example. It just occurs to me. Um, one of the things that uh, that I, one of the inspirations was from a book. I, I love books. I love reading. And I bought a lot of gardening books in my early years. In one of them, there was a photograph of grass growing along the side of a building. And I thought this was fascinating. How on earth did they get that grass to grow up the side of a building, up set of steps that were alongside? But hmm, could I do something like that? How could I get grass to grow someplace that it was not on the ground? Well, we happen to have um, some a big old dead tree, and I thought, okay, maybe I can get grass to grow up the side of this tree. Another collaborator. Mike, my great friend, Mike Hudgens, who's a landscape, ar uh, landscape architect, Mike said, maybe you can get it to circle up the tree like a grass snake. And I thought that was really funny. So I thought, okay, that's what I'm gonna try to do. So I went to, to, to Jacques and I said, okay, Jacques, how can we do this? How can we make this work? How can I get grass and grass seed? Maybe we could make some sort of a slurry with clay and water and stick some grass seed in it and spray it up on the tree trunk or put it on, 
he said, why don't you just buy some sod? <laughs> just buy some sod. There's the nice practical collaboration. Um, so that's what we did. Bought some sod, put the two sides of the sod back to back with the grass on the outside, folded it in half, in other words, and just nailed it to the tree with chicken wire. Um, to water it, we have a, a hose that is a perforated hose that grows, draws water from, from the lake. Anyway, that's a that's an idea, a, 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 a notion that is, is fun because the grass snake, of course, is um, uh, an allusion to the Garden of Eden, to gardens as paradise and so on. But, but put that to side. In terms of a collaboration, I think that there have been um, three or mm, I don't know how many. Jacques, certainly. Jacques is a, is a country man who knows how to do things. And if he doesn't know how, he can figure it out. Um, another man who, who works with Jacques and me is uh, Ken. Ken is terrific, the same kind of man, stronger and younger. So if there are a lot of big rocks to be moved, trees, whatever, Ken's your guy. Um, Mike Hodgins is uh, is certainly probably the biggest inspiration for me. He was the person that I went to when I first started to, to think about a garden, when I knew nothing about gardening. And I went and I looked to, you know, as many of us do, to a professional, somebody with training. And, and um, over the years, that relationship has changed so dramatically. He started off as a teacher, um, as a as I was his I was his client we are now good friends and um, and now we collaborate um, less and less I'll go to him with an idea and I'll say Mike I was thinking about doing this and he'll say well what about that and a back and forth conversation happens and we end up with something that is better than I could have done on my own and perhaps even better than he might have done on his own. But it's something that has come from um, from sharing ideas and working together. I think it's the way to go on in many parts of life. Yeah, yeah I, 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 I think collaboration always makes things easier and faster and better for yes. sure. Yeah. And I, I love that you talk about your collaborators because usually gardening is effort of a whole lot of people whether it's the suppliers of the plants or the bulbs you yeah. know it, it's a lot of orchestration um and certainly now that i install small gardens <laughs> well and and i have a i have a third man who i can't uh ignore he's a man named john hay john is um a former hollywood costume designer uh oh uh, wow I know. <laughs> no, but he did the costumes for the movie Evita, for instance. Oh my! And, and he was nominated for an Academy Award. He didn't end up winning it, but none of this. John is incredibly talented, and he happened to move from Italy, from the U.S., to our little village of North Hatley. And John and I have worked together on so many of the art projects because for him it's it's a it's a vacation. He can he can figure out how to put something together that that is just impossible for me. And again, it's a conversation always. And he always says, No, no, you're the person who's doing it. I'm just offering some technical assistance. Well, the technical assistance, if you don't know how to put things together very well, is really important. Yeah, sure. <laughs> so, sure. So, and I and I guess my last group of collaborators, uh, Heather, are all of the people who um, who come to visit the garden, people who I talk to the garden about. They all have wonderful questions or ideas or suggestions, and I love that back and forth kind of conversation with, um, especially with people who come to visit. It's it's terrific. They'll ask something, and they'll we'll, we'll end up having a good good conversation about plants or about techniques or whatever. Right. So I think that's one thing that I also took away is that you are, even if you're not in the garden with them, you've designed pieces to have a conversation or to stimulate them to think about where they are or what path to go down. Um, it's interesting to me that you've used things like words in the garden. Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, so I, I'm curious, um, you know, it sounds like you take inspiration from other people and people who have actually not even gardening experience, like your friend who's the costume designer. 
but you are um, you're stimulating people to think, not just see, but actually experience. And that's kind of interesting to try to pull them in and try to get them to think differently about where they are, not just walk through. Um, so I, I talk to me a little bit about how you are trying to get people to actually be very in the moment hmm. when they're visiting you. You know, I think it's so easy to um, to walk uh, uh, through a garden, to walk through the woods, through a forest, and really not see anything. Um, if you're not, you just, you know, maybe you're chatting and that's great. But if you really want to think about your environment, I think you really need to look. And once you start looking, then surely questions start start arising. Um, why does a plant grow well here versus there? Um, why is it that um, that I like this kind of combination of colors and that combination, which can be equally attractive to somebody else? Why do why does it not speak to me? Um, so that's the way I started to think about about things. You mentioned at the beginning the the. This particular piece of land has an extraordinarily rich history. And uh, whether it's the, uh, the trees that were planted, you know, 100 years ago, or, or the, uh, the, the foundation of, of old summer cottages that I kept stumbling across, um, the history of the land started me questioning all kinds of things. And whereas I started as a gardener, I think wanting to create a beautiful environment, which I still want to do, I started thinking that maybe there were, I could push against those limits. Maybe there was something more than simply aesthetics that could be experienced. So I started one, I've, I, I, um, I do a lot of questioning, I do a lot of talking, I do a lot of thinking. And I started thinking about the land and I started thinking about the people who lived here and people who had lived here and what their experience might have been like. So for me, when I when I when people come here, I want them to see more than the beauty. The beauty is is there. It's it's in part um, a natural beauty. It's the landscape itself is gorgeous. The wildflowers that bloom are are so fabulous, just in themselves. I don't need to do anything to enhance them, um, but I'd like them to think about something more than aesthetics. And the primary thing that I want me to think about, and I want other people to think about, is the way um, what we do, the impact that we have. On our surroundings, the impact uh, on our environment, the choices that we make, and how they um, how they affect the world that we live in, hugely important. I mean, this is a big thing for you with pollinator gardens, and um, it's it's just huge. Um, yeah, and and I I really appreciated that you uh, paid homage to what had come before on your land, um, going all the way back um, to the Indians who would have originally lived there to the resort that was at one point on your place. And actually, as you said, you stumbled over the foundations, <laughs> but they actually kind of become part of the garden and become some of the stories in the garden. Well, so, I think so. Yeah, sorry, sorry. Oh, no, no, I was gonna ask you, every so, garden, every yeah, garden so, has a story. Every garden has a story that it can tell. And right. sometimes you have to look very hard for it, but it's there, it's there. And the, here the stories are so easy to tell. So the stories of the Abenaki, or the, the stories of the, of the cottagers, the story of, and you know, everything that we do in our garden, it seems to me, or at least now I'm, when I, I'll, I'll go a different way. When I first started, I wanted to do everything. I wanted to just control every little piece. Maybe that tree, if it had that branch taken off, it would be more. I reluctantly learned 
that first of all, I can't control nature. And secondly, even if I could, I don't have enough years left to control it. <laughs> so, so we start making choices. And um, one of the choices that I think we need to make is uh, in terms of, of, of acknowledging what has happened and thinking about how what we are doing is going to have an impact on the future. Uh, I love that because I think that's um, something that um, I, I try to do in a way that's not preachy. Uh, I try yeah. to do it in a way as an inspiration. And I think you are created a very inspirational garden to get people to think differently. And one of the things that I really appreciated that you talked about is you embrace some of the challenges of your property like one of your fields is constantly wet so you embrace that and turned it into the skating pond for example so can you talk a little bit about when you're presented with a garden that doesn't have an ideal condition hmm. and how you might you know take that and turn it into something that actually will work based on your situation where you had a soggy spot well, I think that's a pretty obvious one. If you've got a soggy spot, don't try and dry it out. Just embrace the aspect of water. You know, if it's a if it if it's a small area, a nice rain garden, wonderful plants that you can use. Um, I I this part of the field that was soggy was just a fabulous opportunity because I wanted people to go away from the area around the house. Um, and I knew that if that field was wet, if we could create a pond, which we could do, um, then it would be such a natural attraction. How do other people deal with, how, I don't know how you deal with, um, with extremely dry conditions. I've never had to face those, but I did have one little tiny area that was always dry. And I thought, maybe I could make it into a little gravel garden, which I've done. It's not very successful yet because I'm still learning how to, how to, um, how to work with, in, in, to, with plants that, that like to grow in gravel. And I don't want to have too many. I want it to remain kind of Zen-like. Um, so I'm still experimenting there. Um, if you have huge amounts of rainfall, that's, you know, you, you're not going to, plant many dry weather plants, um, shade and, and, and uh, sunshine. I wish I had more sunny areas in my garden. I've got a very shady, overall a very shady garden and the areas that are sunny are fields rather than, um, and, and I can't garden. You know, we've mentioned 750 acres. This is not 750 acres of gardens. People really need to understand that. Um, I don't, I don't know how large the gardened area is, but most of this land is um, uh, some unused farm fields, some farm fields and some forested areas. Uh, we have tons of problems with deer. So I have to be very careful of what I plant as, as I don't, I do have groundhogs, but they don't seem to bother me as much as yours bother no, you. No, I, my garden is apparently very delicious. So it gets eaten <laughs> routinely by my very large groundhog So I, and his babies. Now I have more than one. Yes. Um, so, <laughs> uh, but you, you know, you talk a little bit about that. I know that you wanted to honor your mom with a, a dogwood tree and you talk about the struggles of having a dogwood tree in 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 canada but mm. you instead envisioned that dogwood tree some other way and so i thought that's a really neat thing to talk about is some of the things okay. you've created to in memory uh or in honor yeah. of uh your family well, that's a nice, yeah, okay, I'm happy to talk about that. Um, it, and then I, I wanna start with plants because I did grow up in Virginia and the plants that are so beautiful in the spring in Virginia were the ones that I loved. Azaleas, rhododendron, magnolia, and boxwood and dogwood. And I have found varieties of azaleas that will bloom here. Lots of cold hardy azaleas now. Magnolia trees, I've got three magnolia, no, 
I've got two varieties of magnolia trees. They're still, they're never going to get to be those big um, uh, ones with the deciduous leaves like grew across the street from the house I grew up in. Those I can't grow, but the magnolias that bloom in the spring, I can. Um, in terms of, so I went from d trying to figure out how I could make those plants that were part of my childhood grow here to thinking, okay, give up on the things that are really always going to fail. There's no point in continuing to try to grow uh, um, Cornus Florida. It's just never going to bloom. It's going to die every winter. Coosa dogwood. Okay, maybe, but I haven't had any luck with it. So when it when my mother died and I decided I really wanted to create something in memory of her, I did want to use this dogwood tree. It was so um, much a part of, of, of the gardens that she and I grew up with. Um, it was so much a part of Virginia. The dogwood flower is the state symbol, but I couldn't use the real thing. Little dogwood, twig dogwoods that grow wild here, didn't want that. So instead I had thought, okay, the image of a dogwood tree. Uh, how could I how could I do that? The idea of, of a tree was important to me because she was really interested in genealogy. So it was a bit like a family tree. You go through with an art project, because I decided that's the only thing that could work. You go through so many ideas, so many iterations, so many ways of thinking about the thing. What I finally decided to do was to use um, a glass glass panels that were um, etched, but it, think of shower stalls. And sometimes, you know, you or off the front door to someone's house, you'll see the, the design etched onto grass panels. I decided instead to do the reverse of that, to, to show the outline of a dogwood tree um, in the clear glass and to, to put that frosted quality to the rest of the glass. That appealed to me because it was spoke of absence and it was like that emptiness that, that happened after she died. It took me a long time to do this, but I, I really um, think that it has been, it's a very satisfying part of the garden for me. Um, after my uh, husband retired, he was a journalist for, for many years. Uh, he was a, a reporter, an editor, a, a columnist. He wrote a political column. So after he retired, after 50 years as a journalist, I thought, okay, what are we going to do uh, to memorialize, to, memor to, to honor your career? He said, nothing. I don't want to do <laughs> Don't do anything. I said, oh, no, we've got to do something. So I worked away at it bit by bit by bit until finally he agreed. And what I've done is um, a imagine um, a column. I think it's eight, 10 feet tall. I don't remember, 12 feet tall, probably with all of the bits at the bottom. And it's um, a glass square, ends in a, in a, a column top. Um, and it's filled with stacked newspapers because of course those were his columns. His, so it was the journalist, the Webster's column is its name. That's one way that um, he agreed finally by uh, saying, well, you know, if we can come up with some humor to it, something that makes it a little bit lighter. So he chose quotations that go around the base. They're all negative quotations about journals, journalism and journalists. <laughs> And uh, which gave him a lot of pleasure. And um, I'll just, the, the one that probably most people would be familiar with is um, Spiro Agnew's quotation, um, who he called journalists nattering nabobs of negativism. So that's one of the quotes. <laughs> He, at least he made an alliteration. He did. He did. <laughs> this is yeah. so sounds so bad as an alliteration. Yeah. <laughs> but I've done these columns. Um, I've done a, a different kind of column for um, for my um, uh, for my brother-in-law, my sister's husband. I, I did one uh, for my father after he died, and those are painted tree trunks. So, in a variety of ways, I've tried to bring the people I love into the garden and and they're constantly there 
in a in a just in a different kind of way. Well, wow, that's so nice. Well, I'm going to give you a break to take a a, a, a sip of water or or, or right. catch your breath for a minute. Uh, yep. There are a couple other people who are saying hello to you uh, while you oh. do that. Uh, Pat says hello from across the lake. Oh. And uh, Jane from North Hatley. You've got uh, people you're in your backyard with us today. Oh. Uh, Christine okay. Froelich says the dragon tail is a really bold move. I love it. If you've got other questions or uh, comments for Patterson, I'll be glad to read those for her so she can uh, catch her breath. Um, but um, uh, certainly, uh, Mason says, I am loving this. <laughs> <laughs> Me too, Mason. Uh, so, you know, when you are um, talking about some of the uh, memorials and things you've created, one of the ones I love that you created regarding the property is the Glen Villa uh, Hotel that was once there. Uh, as you built your garden, you found relics from the garden and you collaborated with an artist. So do you want to talk a little bit about that, how you memorialized or memorialized the previous uh, residents, even if they were temporarily residents <laughs> of your property? Oh, I wish I could show people the photograph of Glen Villa Inn. It was um, one of those old summer resort hotels. It was huge. Uh, the man who created it liked to say that it had 365 rooms, one for every day of the year. I'm wow. sure he was exaggerating. I'm sure he counted <laughs> room closets and uh, you know storage rooms and whatever. But it was a very big, impressive hotel. He built it for um, for the tourists who came from across Canada, but mostly, interestingly, from the U.S. from the southern states, and they came up here to be because it was not the north, and it was not that long after the American Civil War. Um, they came up and they would stay for months or weeks or whatever. So it was a really big, important um, tourist attraction in this part of the world. But also it was very short lived. Um, it was built in 1902. It burned down in 1909. Um, one of the first things that I noticed when I started thinking about trying to create a garden here was the 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 foundation of this old hotel was is still there. It is still there now. I can see it out my window. And it, it was sort of like a ghost, Heather. It was like this huge ghostly presence. Um, the strange thing is when I was exploring this property that we had just acquired and trying to understand it, I discovered pieces of broken china that had been used in the hotel's kitchen stumbled across a whole mass of them, collected them, didn't know have any idea what I was going to do with them, but I figured, okay, they're going to come in useful. They're going to come in handy. I've got to do something with them eventually. Took me about three or four years before I finally came up with this idea of using them to create um, a kind of reimagined hotel. Uh, so it's a piece of property that was, we've had to flatten a bit, but it was pretty well flattened because a building had been there uh, originally. I've used those pieces of broken china to create a kind of mosaic at the entrance, like a welcome mat. There's a bedroom, there's a table, then I set the table with um, pieces of, of, well, I used the pieces of broken china for a rug underneath the table. The table I set with um, bits and pieces that I could collect, but also with plates that our children had used when they were growing up. No. Because for me, it was really important to make this connection. It was one thing to reimagine the hotel and to honor it, but what could I bring that into the present? Could I could I make that link with between the past and the present? And that was what I thought I was doing when I, uh, when I used these plates that our children had grown up with. The China Terrace, like many other parts of the garden, keeps evolving. I think I started it in 2002. Um, the bed in this, well, of course, it's a hotel. It's got to have a bedroom. So it's got a little bedroom. Um, and how many bedspreads has it had on it? Uh, 
I can count four without even thinking. And I'm not talking about fabrics. I'm talking about plants. So it started off with a combination of annuals. And at one point I got tired of digging those annuals up. They couldn't survive the winter. I tried different annuals. Uh, um, there was a moss bedspread at one point. And now it's covered with um, um, sweet woodruff. So it blooms white in the shade in the spring and the, oh, the scent is magnificent. Oh, that, that's amazing. <laughs> but I, I, I like how you've repurposed things that you found. And um, as a child who also grew up in the woods, I really love the area where you have the sugaring and you guys used to be Ooh. your maple syrup. And you actually pictures of your family like taking part of the sugaring process. So. I, I like that you pull traditions into the into the now as well that that property had. So yeah. can you talk a little bit about that? Well, I think that you know to 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 remember the past is important, but really to think of the future is even more important. And the way you do that is by making the past relevant to people today and making it real. Um, the 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 orange sugar camp i i name everything I, everything for me has to have words connected with it but the name of that is really important because Oren was a real person. He was a man I knew. He used to work for my father-in-law. I knew him well as an older man. And he and my father and my husband all worked together to make maple syrup when my husband was a boy. And so Oren was the one who drove the team of horses. Again, you know, when I say the, the uh, I stumbled over a foundation ruin, this place is just littered with bits and pieces of the past. And walking through the woods one day, I noticed the remnant of a stone wall. I asked Norman, my husband, what, what was that from? And he said, oh, that's where we used to have a sugar camp. So again, I thought, what am I going to do? How am I going to bring that into the present? Um, and when we say sugar camp, for those of us oh, who yes. did not go around maple syrup, you might want to explain oh. <laughs> what a sugar camp is. <laughs> I should. Yes, of course. Of course, not everyone knows. Well, in the spring, first of all, you start with maple trees. You have to you have to have a grove of maple trees. You tap them in the springtime when the sap begins to rise. You take that sap and you take it to a place where you can boil it down. 40 gallons of maple sap end up as one gallon of maple syrup. So the ratio is four to one. You have to do a lot of boiling and a lot of, of, of working. But what you have to have more than anything is um, maple trees and you have to have a building where you can boil. So we still make maple syrup and um, not in the place that Oren did. So that's like the China Terrace, a kind of recreation of the past, but using bits and pieces. And the best part of that, or the most interesting part to me in terms of, of uh, the environment, is that there are very few maple trees in this section. There is this natural process of succession so now we have far more evergreens there than maple trees. But if I was going to recreate a maple sugar camp, what I had to do was have maple leaves at least. So I got my local tinsmith, cut out maple leaves out of very out of pieces of tin, which we suspended from trees at various heights, various sizes. And they are magical. Heather, if you were to walk through there now in the winter, You'd see snow on some, you'd see oh, wow. ice on some, you'd see, you might see icicles hanging from some. And at every time of the year, the way we've, we've suspended them, they knock against one another. And the music isn't really musical, but it is like the tinkling of the bells on the harnesses that the horses that dragged the carts used to use. Oh, so it's, it's it. a wonderful memory. It's a wonderful soundscape, if you will. Well, Christine Froelich says, I love the whole story about your connection to the land and how it influenced the garden. And Christina Basonic says, sign me up for sugar camp. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I think that best. sounds like a lot of fun. Yeah. And the, you know, the very best part, we, we still have at the end of the season, you know, the, some of the, 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 the sap stops running at a certain point. You've made the syrup and you have what's called a sugaring off. The sugaring off is a party. Um, imagine in the 1800s when all of these farms um, made maple syrup, 
but they were also isolated. And so for the winter, so at the end of the winter season, people could come together for a big party. You take the sap, you boil it down even more. You take the syrup and you boil it down even more. And when it's hot, you pour it on fresh snow. Wow. What happens? It immediately becomes toffee. And in the olden days, you take a twig. Now what you do is take um, a popsicle stick and you put it at one end and you twirl it up and you have a toffee lollipop. Love it. <laughs> and it's so it. much fun. So we're going to have a sugaring off this March. If you happen to be around, maybe you maybe you stop in and we'll have a lollipop. <laughs> That sounds like so much fun, but I, I love that you've, you know, you keep these traditions going and, and sort oh, of yeah. honor the history of, of your partner. Sugaring offs are fun. The, 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 every now and then you might even have a glass of something to go with that sugar. <laughs> <laughs> for sure, because I'm sure it's cold during sugaring off, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> and it's muddy because that's the end of the season and the snow is starting to turn to mud. Yeah. Yeah. So Nadia must have read your book or knows your uh, property. She says, Patterson's wonderful garden also honors the history of the First Nations that were on the land. So maybe yes. you can just speak to that. Um, and Hi, who... Nadia. Yes. <laughs> yes, she has. Nadia is, uh, has come to visit with her, her mother, who I think was well into her 80s and wandered around the garden. Um, the, recognizing the presence of the first people who lived here was something that really mattered to me. I'm not sure exactly why it mattered so much, except that it was part of a... Um, I started thinking about this so many years ago, and um, I have tried to, to uh, reflect what actually happened. It's not, a, it's not a positive story, it's not an entirely happy story. But it's a story which I think deserves to be told. Uh, the Abenaki were migratory. They believed that human beings were created using the ash tree. So I found in the woods um, ash trees, we have many of them, that had forked branches. And by inverting them it, and stripping off the bark, it looked as if they turned into people who were walking across the land, migratory. Um, I've I've used these um, this way of recognizing the Abenaki in a, a variety of places along the, the uh, along a trail that I've created called Timelines. Um, the presence of the Abenaki initially very positive, then perhaps less positive as after the arrival of Europeans when um, we started fencing off the land, um, sending children away from their homes and their perhaps with motives that we thought were good at the time, but with not very good consequences. So it's, it, so recognizing this, it's part of our reality. And um, again, if we're looking toward the future, recognizing what happened in the past is, is, um, is part of the way of, of changing, part of the way of moving forward. Yeah, I absolutely, I, I, I agree hundred percent. So, um, just in last being a pollinator gardener, I love that you talk about, you know, how you've embraced the native plants from your geography. Um, you also talk about that you're not a purist, neither am I. And um, obviously this is a huge debate in the industry right now mm -hmm. as to whether mm -hmm. both can coexist. And so um, can you just talk about sort of like lessons learned or how native plants have now come to influence your design and your interpretation of what you think is, is, is the right way forward to get people inspired to grow more natives? Natives perform well. I mean, that's, if you want to start with a very simple practical reason for using them, a native plant, a plant that's native to your area, whether it is indigenous or whether it was introduced, you know, 200 years ago, call it native, if you will. Um, those are the plants that do well. So why not use the plants that are doing well? If you, you know, if, if you have a plant that does well for you, go overboard and use it everywhere. Um, I also found that I actually liked um, many of the, the native plants I found were more appealing to me perhaps because they were simpler. They, they felt more appropriate for um, an informal country garden than more um, hybridized, more cultivated cultivars. Um, 
And then there are the issues with the deer. You know, deer tend to leave those native plants alone. That's been my experience too. They they, they don't prefer them. <laughs> they don't. They don't. And uh, and that's why that plant has done well in that area. That's why it's native to that area because it right. it can. Uh, and then there are all the, um, you know, garden garden design and garden um, plant choices change along with with as with society as as, as things change and develop and we're in an area uh, a time frame right now when people are much more um, interested much more concerned with trying to um trying to be kind to to the environment trying to offer pollinators the the the, the resources that they need so i think I think there is nothing that works as well as those native plants. And I'm trying to use more and more and more of them. We stopped mowing the lawn, for instance, in a big area. What we used to have, what we used to call the big lawn is now the big meadow. Well, I'm not trying to create a wildflower meadow. I'm more or less letting nature create it on its own. That has some drawbacks. I have to control some of the, the, the noxious plants. I don't want a lot of ragweed growing because I have allergies. Right, so, um, right. so uh, but by and large, native plants work so beautifully. And the more of them we can use, I think the better it is for all of us. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And I think I love that. I love that philosophy. Um, you're welcome to my camp anytime because I think it's a, a very positive message. It's not a you must do this. It's no why 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 it works and i would say a lot of the people i i do designs for they just really don't want the maintenance and they're concerned about the chemicals and uh, what we know about natives is that they're extremely low maintenance they're not no maintenance but they're low um, and they really don't require chemical input. So if you're concerned about that for your children or your pets or yeah. yourself, um, not putting chemicals, which right now are extremely expensive anyway, um, and as well, I think can also um, uh, deal with the changing weather patterns that you might be experiencing. So in September, we got no rain here in central Pennsylvania, so it was extremely challenging. Mm. Uh, but once I find they're pretty much established by year two, I really don't have to do the watering. It's uh, pretty much they are, yeah. they're happy, regardless if it's freezing or broiling or raining or not, they don't care. <laughs> well, you know, and these native seed mixes can be pluses and minuses with them. Um, you know, they, they most most of them are, are annuals only. So if, you, if you're gonna ex throw them out once and expect to have that beautiful uh, color, a palette every year forget it it's not going to happen but um and it takes time and effort to establish uh, a wildflower meadow so i'm lazy i think that's a great yeah. advantage that, too let, let nature do it. the work for you it, exactly this time of year i tell people to be a little bit of a lazy gardener because you're also then creating a situation for habitat for your overwintering insects and birds but those are nature's bird feeders. So um, it means in the spring, I will have tons of starts all over my garden, yep. but those are then plants that I can uh, share with thoughtful gardeners like you. So I am so thrilled. This has been so much fun. And the so comments fun. in the uh, QA are just continue to come in with, uh, this is such a fun uh, conversation and you're a great storyteller. For those who haven't read the book, where would be a good place for them to look for it? Well, I hate to recommend Amazon, but Amazon does deliver. Yeah. <laughs> and, it's, and it's universally available, I think. Um, I hope that local bookstores, independent bookstores, if you have one in your neighborhood, can um, will certainly be able to order it for you. It was published by McGill Queens University Press. And um, uh, it's it is available internationally through bookstores everywhere yes and i would encourage everybody to ask your local library to carry it uh, oh, of I course think, of course yes, um so that's what i'm going to do with mine i'm going to donate mine copy to oh, our nice. local library to share with the garden community because i think it's so such a great book um but i am so grateful for you being here and for everyone who stayed through our lunch we it's a delight to have you here 
You're getting lots of kudos. Thank you for the inspiration, says Shelly. You're getting tons of kudos in the, in the comments. So um, lots of friends, it sounds like, have joined you here as well as um, people from the audience. And we will um, definitely uh, put this recording up uh, so that uh, you can share that with other audiences uh, as well. So if we missed someone who missed it, no worries. Uh, we'll put it up on our YouTube channel as well. If you're interested in seeing uh, wonderful uh, in inspirational interviews like this one, uh, please join us on our my YouTube channel, which is Garden Thoughtfully. We'd love to continue the conversation there. And uh, thank you so much. I'm so inspired to come visit you. So, I hope you will. Uh, <laughs> and uh, thank you again, everyone, for being with us today. We really appreciate your time. Thanks, Heather. You're that welcome. Have a great day. Bye. Take care, everyone. Bye now.